Acts chapter 7, and we are continuing our study through the book of Acts, and really uh, this chapter right here, we were leading up to it in chapter 6. I do want to start, I want to go back to chapter 6 uh, at the very end there to really see why Stephen is even giving this uh, sermon or this really defense. So that's what we see here. Is that, so in Acts chapter 6 and verse 12, we see that there's a bunch of people that were stirred up and they were, he was brought before the council. Uh, basically, false accusations were brought against them and all this stuff. So, in verse 12 of Ch- Acts chapter 6, it says, And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place, and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on him, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. So this goes straight into chapter 7, where it says in verse 1, Then said the high priest, Are these things so? So uh, this this is just so reminiscent of what happened with Jesus. So remember, Jesus is brought to the high priest and to all the scribes and all that stuff. And they bring up these false witnesses. And they bring all these ones up, and none of them agree. Except for these two that didn't really agree, but they were close, right? Where it was basically saying, I will destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. It's interesting because they keep talking about this temple being destroyed. That's all they care about is their temple and the building and all that stuff. But uh, So it's very reminiscent of that as far as Jesus and you know what happened to him, the false accusations. And so, but the one thing that I want you to see with this, before we get into his sermon or to his, to his defense, pretty much, the, the oration that he gives, is the fact that Stephen, I know that he's filled with the Holy Ghost, and I know that it's under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost that this is written, that this is the Word of God, but I don't believe that the Holy Ghost was just telling him what to say, meaning like he was just speaking in his ears, and then he just started basically spouting off what the Holy Ghost was talking to him. I believe what he does here is, is straight off memory. So he knew the Bible, and he just basically gives this rundown from Abraham all the way down to Solomon of all this history. Okay, and You say, well, why did he start with Abraham? Why didn't he start with, with Adam? Well, because they're talking about Moses, and they're talking about the temple, and he's talking about all this stuff, so he's going to hit on Moses quite a bit. But he's going all the way back to Abraham because they're Jews, right? And it's all about we're sons of Abraham and Abraham's our father and all this stuff, right? And so he's basically, you know what he's doing is he's going to school them. Because they're basically looking at him like, you know, you're speaking blasphemous words against this place, against Moses and all this stuff. And he's going to show them that he knows the Bible, that he's not just someone out there just spouting off things, but he actually knows the Bible. And I challenge anyone, unless you memorize this chapter, you know, to have that kind of knowledge where you can just start going from Abraham down to Solomon and just start pointing out all these facts and just telling the story perfectly. Okay? Perfectly. Okay? Meaning that he just, he's quoting, some of the stuff is direct quotes. Some of the stuff is just kind of paraphrasing what's going on. But he has some Bible knowledge. And this kind of reminds, it just makes me think of the fact that when we're brought before the judgment seats and we're brought before synagogues and we're brought before you know, magistrates and all this stuff, in which it says that it was going to happen to them, but it also applies to us in the future, okay? meaning that this has happened throughout time. You know, When the Catholic Church, for example, was persecuting Christians, they were brought before the magistrates and they had to the answer. You think of William Tyndale, who was burned at the stake, and you know, he basically gave his defense. Now, they ultimately killed him, but... You know, the same kind of thing. And this is throughout all of history, you know, in the New Testament that we're dealing with this. But like I said, the Holy Ghost, you can be filled with the Holy Ghost, but the Holy Ghost can only bring to remembrance that which you've already had in memory, right? And so uh, I want you to think about this. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Because they're bringing up, and, and it's interesting because it talks about these these, uh, you know, vain babblings and profane babblings and all this stuff. And that's literally what they're bringing up. They're bringing up all this stuff. They're saying, well, you know, he's saying that Jesus and Nazareth is going to destroy this temple. And 
like I said, I already touched on that. You know, Jesus said that there's not going to be one stone left upon another, but it didn't say that he was literally going to come down and do it himself, right? Obviously, we know from history that Rome is the one that came in and actually did that. Now, I believe it was of God. I believe it was the judgment of God. He just used Rome to do it. But in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14, it says, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. See, Stephen is here, and he's standing before the judgment seat, but he's not ashamed. Remember, they saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Right? He wasn't ashamed. He wasn't, like, his countenance wasn't just, like, dropped because, you know, he's at this judgment seat. He knows that he's righteous. He knows that he's doing right, and he knows that he believes right, and he's about to throw down. Okay? And that's not a biblical term, but that's the way I'm going to say it. He's about to throw down on these guys on some biblical truth. Okay? And... And go to 1 Peter chapter 3, because it's something that we need to be studying to show ourselves a prudent unto God. We need to be studying the Bible, memorizing the Bible, because you never know when you're going to need to make your defense. Now, you say, well, you know, yeah, in the Great Tribulation, if we're here for that, then, you know, and we're brought before judgment seat. Well, how about this? What if the day comes when they say, you can't homeschool your children, you're going to have to put them in our public school. Do you have the Bible to prove that it's your right. And, you know, you think about vaccinations. You think about uh, anything like that. You think about even the right to bear arms. You say, well, you know, the Constitution, how about Jesus said, buy a sword? You know, when it, when it comes to anything, when, when, when it comes to the world that we live in, they're constantly wanting to try to oppress any, everybody, right, really. But ultimately, they're trying to oppress Christians. You know, that's what, that's what the devil wants to do. Uh, the principalities and the rulers of darkness of this world. But are, do you have an answer? Would you be ready if you were standing before a magistrate and the magistrate said, hey, you know, we're, we're, we have you gathered here because you spank your children. You th- and you say, well, you know, is that going to happen? And I think everybody here already knows that that could happen, that there's already states that are taking away children because of that and other things. And so... Uh, but, listen, do you have the Bible? Could you, if you were standing before them right now and you didn't have the Bible in your hand, could you say, you know, he that spareth the rod hateth his son, but he that loveth his son chasteneth him betimes. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Would you have that on your mouth? You know, would you have that at your, at your disposal, Right? Because what I'm talking about right here, and what you're dealing with with Stephen, is he didn't have it. Just he didn't have a scroll out there and be like, "Let me read you from Genesis, you know, down to uh, down to the Kings of what's going on." Okay, he didn't have the, you know, and obviously back then, and it's kind of silly because obviously we're very blessed today because the printing press was coming out around the time the King James Bible was translated, and so to have it, you know, at your fingertips like this is a is a fairly new thing. You know, to have it right there at your fingertips. And we're blessed to have it that way. But, you know, Stephen, you know, it talks about him being full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and we're really seeing it being proved as far as his knowledge of the Bible. Uh, But in 1 Peter chapter 3, I had to turn there. uh, In verse 14, it says, But in if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. And it's exactly what they're doing to Stephen. But he sanctified the Lord God in his heart. And he was ready to give an answer to every man that asketh him a reason of the hope that is in, in him. And so we need to be ready for that. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 28, it says, The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. And it talks about in Colossians chapter 4, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. And so what I'm saying with this is that Stephen was prepared. Stephen wasn't going in this as a novice. He was ready. And what it comes down to is that the Bible says not to premeditate what you're going to say. Okay, so he didn't just like, 
have this thing memorized. Does that make sense? He didn't have this dissertation that he's about to give, or this, this basically where he's about to throw down on them. This was basically, he had, it, he had a lot of Bible memorized, and he knew it, but what the Holy Ghost was doing was bringing it to, to remembrance. And, you know, that's where you want to be. Is you want to have so much Bible memorized to where when that comes and you're filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will be pulling this out of your memory, and you're just like, boom, 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 just bringing it down. And you're just, you know, you know where it's at, and you know what you're saying. And uh, you don't want it to be rehearsed, though, okay? Because the, the Holy Ghost is where you want the power to be. You want it to be in God, that he's the one that is speaking through you, through, with his word. But ultimately, you have to have it memorized. You have to, have, you have to know it, okay? So going into this, uh, like I said, you know, he's given a dissertation basically from Abraham down to Solomon with some other stuff in there. Even going into Babylon, you know, them gonna, they're going to be taken captive into Babylon. He brings up a lot of stuff. And when I was writing this sermon... I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go through this, and I'm going to cite everything that he says, and I'm going to basically show you, like, hey, here's where it's at. Here's where it's at. We'd be here forever, okay? I started it, and I had, like, four pages, and I didn't get very far. I'm like, nope, that's not going to happen. So what I'm going to do is highlight it. I'm going to do highlights. So there's no way that I can go verse by verse through this and show you, okay, over here in Genesis chapter 12, over here in Genesis 15, over here in Genesis 17, you know, and show you all the references, but I'll say this, there is a reference for all this stuff. And so in your own study, you can do that. Um, but what I want to do is show some highlights. And what I really want to do is show you some things that Stephen uh, gives you a little more information about and some places where he just highlights some important things that, uh, and maybe clarify some things that maybe are a little more, maybe a little ambiguous in the Old Testament. And I'll use that loosely, okay? Because what people say sometimes is ambiguous is just because they don't want to believe it, <laughs> okay? But uh, the first thing I want you to see is what he says about Abraham here. Starting off in verse 2 there, he says, And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Charon, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans, and dwelt in Charon. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. Now, the reason that I'm obviously starting here, because this is where he starts, but um, one thing that when you're reading the Old Testament, when you're reading Genesis, go back to Genesis chapter 11 and 12. We're going to start at the end of chapter 11 there is the one thing that we see here actually is Genesis 12, the, very, the first three verses there, is actually something that God said to Abraham before he left Ur the Chaldees. Okay? But you may not have noticed that because obviously it comes after chapter 11, right? when it talks about him departing from Ur the Chaldees and going into Haran. Um, but this shows you the clear progression. So basically Stephen's clearing it up for you. He's basically uh, showing you, hey, God spoke to him when he was in Ur of the Chaldees and said, Get thee out of thy country. And so I want, you, I want you to see that. So when you go to Genesis chapter 11, verse 27, Genesis chapter 11, verse 27, again, I'm going to go through highlights, so don't worry if you're like, Oh, this is taking too. We're only got to verse like five or something like that. We're not hitting every single thing here because a lot of this is just straight up. He's just quoting the Old Testament. Okay? But in verse 27, it says this It says, Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur the Chaldees. So we know that they're all from Ur the Chaldees. Now where is Ka the Chaldeans? That's where Babylon's at. Okay, That's interesting to know anyway when it comes to the fact of where did Abraham even come from. You know, Israel wasn't always a nation. And so uh, obviously you know, he came from somewhere... And so in verse 29, it says, And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife, 
And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 days, and Terah died in Haran. So at this point in the story, when you're reading through Genesis, right? You're just reading chronologically. What do you see? They leave Ur of the Chaldees, and they go into Haran. Now, in, the, in Acts, it says Karen, okay? Now, this all comes down to how it's transliterated because what you have there is a hard H, okay? Hard H sound. And so, in the New Testament, like, if you're looking in Jer- Jeremiah, for example, where it says Rachel weeping for her children, it actually says Rahel, R-A-H-E-L. In the New Testament, it says Rachel. And it's because that hard H is translated into C-H, okay? And this is just how it's translated today. So when you're looking at it and you're like, oh, that's a different place. No, it's the same place. It's just the fact that one's coming from Hebrew, one's coming from Greek. And when you translate it, literate it into English. Anyway, all I have to say is that um, if, you under, if you understand a little bit about how languages work and stuff like that, then you'll know that that's not a mistake. It's just the way it is. But all I have to say is that it's the same place. But we see that in this story in, in Genesis chapter 11, that we get up to where Terah dies in Haran. So they've already left Ur of the Chaldees. Then you go to Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord had said. That's the key. Do you see that? Where it said, it didn't say the Lord said, it says the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So it's a very famous passage, but you may not have noticed it in Genesis that that was actually said to Abraham before he left Ur of the Chaldees. Because when you're in Acts chapter 7, notice that in Acts chapter 7, what does it say? Acts chapter 7, in, in verse 3 there, or in verse, uh, in verse 2, it says, the, Lord God, the, the, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Charon. Do you see how it's very clear? Before he went to Charon, or Haran, right, where his dad died, so he was in Ur of the Chaldees when the Lord appeared unto him. And then it says, and said unto him, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred. Where is that? Genesis chapter 12. But then it says, in verse 4, it says, Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans, so then, it's after that, and dwelt in Charon. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. So all that to say is that Stephen has that understanding, and you can see it when you read it, right? When you go to Genesis chapter 12 and it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, right? The Lord had said unto him, Get thee out of thy country. So it's not like a progression, like his, his father dies in Haran, right? And then the Lord said unto him, get thee out of there and go to Canaan. He's just recapping and saying he did say this to Abraham. You say, why is that important? Because in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he sh- should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whether he went. And notice that, That was said to him before he left. And what was said to him? It says that the scripture foreseeing that it would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So he preached the gospel to him, and by faith he left. Right? So, and you say, Well, that's just minute. I know. It's not that big of a deal. Right? But do you see how it really shows you, okay, when did he say this and stuff like that? And Stephen knew it, he understood it. So he's not just quoting off the story. He's got good understanding of the story. Does that make sense? Now, going on, another highlight here. And this is not really like, a, like giving you more information, but it's really nailing it down. That Israel was in Egypt being evil and treated for 400 years. Okay? Go to verse 6 there of Acts chapter 7. So keep your hand, obviously, in Acts chapter 7. It says, And God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil four hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge 
said God, and after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. Now go down to verse 17 because it's going to talk about that again. So it says in verse 17, it says, But when the time of, of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers. So who, who's the same? Egypt, right? Egypt. And evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children to the end, they might not live. And we know that story in Exodus chapter 2, uh, where it, they were killing all the children, all the male children, right? And that's why, you know, Moses was put into the ark and, you know, sent down the ark made out of bulrushes, not the ark that the animals were on. But uh, you say, well, why is this important? Because there's a lot of people and they always just, I don't know necessarily the extent of why they do this, but they want to say for some reason that the children of Israel were not in Egypt for 400 years. And when they're calculating the age of the earth, they'll say that it was like 300 or 200 and some years. And basically that, that the 430 years, and go to, go to Genesis um, chapter 15 because it, this is, it says it in Genesis 15. But do you see how it's very clear that what nation are you talking about that's evil and treating them? It's Egypt. Okay, It's not just that they're sojourning from Abraham till when they come out of Egypt. Meaning like what they want you to think is that that 430 years is from Abraham to when they come out of Egypt, not from when they were in Egypt, like when Israel goes down into it, and then they're there for 430 years. And they get some weird doctrines out there. They're like, oh, you know, the earth is almost 6,000 years old, therefore Jesus is coming back in two years or something like that. You know what I mean? Like they come up with these weird doctrines, but they're trying to fudge the numbers, right, as far as like how, long the, how old the earth is, where in reality the earth is almost 6,300 years old, okay, so it's like at least, you know, like 200 some years past 6,000, okay? You can't get around this. But what they do is they try to fudge these numbers and be like, well, you know, this is not really 430. But in Genesis 15 and verse 12, it says, And when the sun was gone down, going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a, in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them that, them four hundred years, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. And again, you don't really need me to show you this. And Stephen is really what he's doing there is he's linking that prophecy with what actually happened. <laughs> okay, so you notice in, in Acts chapter seven it talks about how their father they're going to be evil and treated for four hundred years. And then you go down when it's talking about Egypt and them being in Egypt, and it says and evil and treated our fathers, okay? And it's talking about that nation being judged and all this stuff. This all comes down to, they don't want to believe Exodus chapter 12, where it says this. It says in Exodus chapter 12, verse 40, Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it says, And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day it came to pass, that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Not only was it 430 years that they were in Egypt, it was literally to the day. The selfsame day they went in, the selfsame day they came out. It's so perfectly 130 year, or 430 years, that's ridiculous. And it comes down to a misunderstanding of Galatians, where it talks about how the, the promises of Abraham, and it's, it talks about how... Uh, the law, which was 430 years after, can out this and all that should make the promise of none effect. But it talks about how it was confirmed in Christ, and that was confirmed in Jacob when he went in. Okay? And so, uh, but all that to say is that when you look at this, do you see how it clears that up a little bit to where you, Genesis 15, I guess you could say, well, you know, he's just talking about in general, they're being evil and flick, you know, evil and treated like since that point where he sees this vision, you know what I mean? It's really a stretch, okay? <laughs> You're stretching it a lot. But when you go to Acts chapter 7, it's, it's really hard to make that stretch because Stephen's making it very clear that he's talking about them being in Egypt and being evil and treated for 400 years in Egypt. Not just like, well, Egypt is the world power and they're evil and treating them even though they're not even near them, okay? Now, uh, going back to Acts chapter 7 there in verse 14, 
This is something I didn't really, I didn't notice until I was doing this sermon, actually. Um, I could put this under the so-called contradictions, okay? Um, but it's interesting what Stephen says here about how many people came into Egypt, okay? And this is where you got to really, you got to read every word. You got to understand who he's talking about and what he's saying. Because what he's going to say is that 75 people come into Egypt and what it says in the Old Testament is 70 people. Okay? Now, let's see what he says here. So, in verse 14 there, it says, Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him, and all his kindred, three score and fifteen souls. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, and he and our fathers. Okay? So, three score and fifteen, what is that? Well, three score is 60, and add 15 to that, you have 75, okay? Now look at Exodus chapter 1. Go to Exodus chapter 1. This isn't the only place you can see it, but Exodus chapter 1 obviously shows you this number. Actually, I was just, I was going down this list and just kind of showing the citations at this point, and I'm like, wait a minute, 75 and 70 are two different numbers there. (laughs) So, contradiction, close your Bibles, go home. It's all a lie. No, it's, it, you know, people that get hung up on this type of stuff right here really need to get rooted and grounded because this would just be silly if you were like, oh, man, it's, it's messed up. In Exodus chapter 1 and verse 5, it says this, And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. So one says 75, one says 70. Well, let's read this carefully. Exodus chapter 1 and verse 5, what does it say? And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls. These have to be his children, okay? That they come out of your loins, okay? Now, look at Acts chapter 7 and verse 14. It says, Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred. Three score and 15 souls. So he's counting Jacob in that number, first of all. So that means his wives would be in that number. And any kindred, kindred could be cousins, it could be any relative. Does that make sense? So kindred doesn't mean that it's your, out of your bowels, okay, or out of your loins. So it's very easy, right? It just means that there were 70 souls that were his children and grandchildren and like anybody that basically his progenitors. And there's five that weren't his, you know, counting him. If, you're count, if he's counting Jacob there, then, you know, that's at least 71. And then you got his wives, right? Now, we know that, uh, you know, Rachel and, and Leah died, right? So you have two, you know, if, two wives and stuff like that. But other kindred, right? You could have cousins. You could have other family members that are there, okay? And so he's just giving you more information. You say, well, how in the world did he know that? it doesn't say that when you're reading through Genesis and Exodus right there. Well, this comes down to the fact that holy men of God, or it talks about how God, who at sundry times in a diverse manner, spake in time fast unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. There were things that were spoken in the Old Testament that weren't written, right? Because in Matthew chapter 1, remember it said, or Matthew chapter 2, I'm sorry, it says, that he shall be called, you know, as spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. It talks about spoken by Jeremy the prophet that he was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Both those things were not written, you know, the one was not written in Jeremiah, and nowhere in the Old Testament can you see where it says that he was going to be called a Nazarene. But it says they were spoken, okay? And so what I believe is in the New Testament, you know, when the New Testament was completed and everything, everything that was spoken in the Old Testament that wasn't written, that's pertinent, or that that is anything that we need, is written in the New Testament. That includes Enoch, right? Enoch prophesied that the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Nowhere in the Old Testament is that mentioned. He's the seventh from Adam, so we're talking about before Noah that this was prophesied, and it was spoken though, it was, and it was it was known that 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 he said that, but it wasn't written down until Jude. Okay, so. Stephen, you know, I believe that it was known, it was spoken, that there were 75 souls that came out. And you say, why, is that really that pertinent? Well, it's in the Bible, so 
I believe everything's pertinent for some reason, you know. We just may not know why. That's, that's good to know, okay? But all that to say is that, yeah, when, when those that were writing down Scripture, the apostles and all that stuff, they were getting revelation. But a lot of that revelation and a lot of the stuff that we see written in the New Testament was probably a lot of the stuff that was spoken that wasn't written, right? To where you, because the, the wrong idea is to go into the Old Testament thinking, well, all, only what's written is what they knew. That's a foolish way of going into it because there's a lot of things that were spoken that were known that were spoken by the prophets over and over and over and over again that wasn't written down particularly. And think about this too. Most of them didn't have a Bible written down. Like they didn't have, they didn't have the printing press back then. So most of it was, was oral meaning that they were hearing it from the prophets, and that's why it was so important to understand who was a real prophet and who wasn't a real prophet, right? But in the New Testament, we have a more sure word of prophecy. We don't have to worry about that because we can go straight here, and you need not that any man teach you. Okay, that's the great thing about the, the New Testament. you got the Holy Ghost inside you to teach you all things and, and to bring to remembrance all things, and so you don't need to worry about, well, is Pastor Robinson a real prophet, and does he really tell me what's the word of God, or I need to discern between that, now, all you need to do is go to the Bible and see whether that's what it says, okay? So, uh, but he also gives some more information about Moses. So here's where he, we saw that with the 75 souls. That's interesting. You say, well, that doesn't mean, you know, that's not pertinent. You never know. Sometimes passages in the Bible where I'm just like, ah, that, you know, that's inconsequential. Later on, I'm like, man, I'm glad that's there. It'll actually prove like some major, you know, like to help like debunk some stupid false doctrine down the line or something like that. You know what I mean? And you won't know that until later. Okay? Genealogies. I mean, First Chronicles. Some of those chapters, the first ten chapters, you're like, what is that? How is that pertinent? It's like, well, it actually helps in some cases when you're proving something. So in Acts chapter seven, verse twenty. We're going to see some some more information about Moses. And again, this goes into that same thing like I was just saying, where this is a lot of the stuff is not written in Exodus. So we don't know this from reading Exodus, but Stephen's saying it, and I believe it's true. I believe it, you know, he's under the you know inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he's filled with the Holy Ghost, and he's giving us information. But again, I think it's basically information that was spoken by prophets down the line, and now it's finally being written. Okay? So in verse 20. It says, In which time Moses was born, and was exceeding fair, and nourished up in his father's house three months. And, he went, and, when, he, and when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him and nourished him for her own son. Now, when you go to Exodus chapter 2, and you can look there, pretty much that's all the information that we got as far as Moses when he's a child, or basically a lot about Moses, right? About I'll read Exodus chapter 2 and verse 10, and then we're going to read the rest of this. Exodus 2 and verse 10, it says, And the child grew, and she brought, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he spied out an Egyptian, spied in Hebrew, one of his brethren. Okay? That's not a lot of information, but it's pretty much just when he grew, he went out to see his brethren's burden, and that's when the Egyptian that he ends up killing and hiding in the sand, right? And we see that he is, he was called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, right? The Pharaoh's daughter took him in, and she's the one that named him. Well, now look at Acts chapter 7 and verse 22. So we kind of already see that. We just read that to, uh, in Acts chapter 7 here in verse 21. It talks about that same thing we read. But in verse 22 it says, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. So we didn't know that, right? We didn't know that, I mean, it makes sense, right? Because he's growing up as Pharaoh, you know, Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter's son, right? Verse 23 it says, And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. So, and I, and I say this because and I always bring up this movie, but the Ten Commandments. This is why watching these movies will really mess up your, your understanding of, <laughs> you know, Bible characters sometimes. But in that movie, Moses didn't know that he was a Hebrew. He didn't know that he wasn't Pharaoh's daughter's son, right? And so, uh, but here it says that it came into his heart to visit his brethren. 
And notice this in verse 24, 24 it says, And seeing one of, his, uh, one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the, the Egyptian. Notice in verse 25, For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. What we see here is that Moses knew that it was supposed to be by his hand to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. But see, when you're reading through the book of Exodus, did you see that? Did you see like where Moses knew that? And that's why he went out there trying to set them in order. And that's why he was out there visiting because he knew that he was supposed to be the deliverer. See, when you're reading through Exodus, you're kind of just thinking, well, you know, he figures that out at the, at the burning bush, right? So it shows you that he was learned in wisdom of the Egyptians. He was mighty in words and deeds. So he was a, he was a mighty man, right? He wasn't just just some bystander, some participant, you know. Basically, he was a mighty man in, in Egypt. And Hebrews gives you more information about Moses, too, talking about how he knew that he, he wanted to suffer the afflictions of Christ and the, peop- the, the, the afflictions of the people of God. And he esteemed the pr- reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, right? But see... None of that, like his mindset, does that make sense? Like we don't understand his mindset when, about before he get, goes to flee into Midian. Does that make sense? But his mindset is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to visit my brethren because, you know, I know that I'm supposed to be the deliverer. I know I'm supposed to be the one that's going to bring them out of here. And he's basically saying, I'm putting off all these riches. I'm putting off all this to suffer affliction with my, with my brethren. He knew that. He understood that, right? And so it's just interesting to see how all that, that fits together. Um, now, going down to Acts chapter 7, verse 37 here. So Stephen is going to bring up this prophecy that Moses said about Jesus, okay? And you say, well, why is he... I, I believe this is the pivotal point in his sermon, Meaning, he's going through all this history, but then he's going to point out, because they're saying, you know, they're, he's blaspheming against this place and against the customs of Moses, and he's bringing this up for a point. He's bringing this up because Moses preached that Jesus would come. Moses said Jesus was com- would come, and they rejected him. Okay, so he's bringing up this passage. Now, this passage was brought up in Acts chapter 3 by Peter as well, but Stephen's bringing it up. And so in Acts chapter 7, verse 37, it says, This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. Now this is brought up in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18 is where Moses is, is preaching to the congregation. And it says, in Deuteronomy 18, you could turn there. This is where it's being quoted from. But I believe this is the pivotal movement because when he goes after this, he's, he's about to lay into him. Okay? Because now he's coming down. He's basically just telling a story up to that point. Does that make sense? He's just kind of telling this story of like, here's what happened with Abraham. Here's what happened with Moses. You know, here's what was going on with Joseph and his brethren. All this stuff. He's just kind of telling the story. Now he's going to bring up this and then he's going to start coming into how Israel like worshipped other gods, how God gave them up, and then he's going to go into them. Okay, so you can see this is kind of like the downhill. He's kind of like talking. They're like, oh, this is, this is all good stuff, right? Until he starts coming here because now he's going to really start hitting them. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, it says, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him shall you hearken. So remember that this prophet, now Moses is speaking in this verse. So the prophet's going to be like unto who? Moses. Right? And Deuteronomy 18, this is where God is talking. It says, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee. So he's talking to Moses, saying, he's, he's, you know, this prophet's going to be like you, Moses. Right? It says, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it, require it of him. Go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, because this goes straight into the Jews rejecting their Messiah, rejecting this prophet that should come. And in turn, they're rejecting Moses. 
They're rejecting the Old Testament. That's right. And all these people that want to say, well, the Jews, they, you, know, they, they worship, you know, they believe in the Old Testament. No, they don't. They reject the Old Testament. Because you can't, you can't say that you, you believe the Old Testament and don't believe the New Testament. That's not a thing. That's impossible. And you can't believe the New Testament if you don't believe the Old Testament, by the way, too. It's a package deal. You can't just take one without the other. Just as much as you can't have the Father without the Son. You can't have the Son without the Father. And so all this comes together. And in John chapter 5, and verse 45, it says, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. So Jesus is speaking here to these people that don't believe, to these Pharisees that don't believe. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? Well, we know that he wrote in a lot of different ways, but particularly he wrote of him because he is that prophet that was going to be like unto Moses. And remember, the law came, uh, was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And Moses is definitely a picture of Christ. And so you say, well, how is he, you know, like unto Moses? Because Moses was the meekest man upon earth. And what did Jesus say? I am meek and lowly. And so, uh, and I already preached on that when we were going through Genesis, or going through like Moses' life and everything. But all that to say is that he's bringing this up for a point because he's pointing out to him that Moses said that Jesus was going to come, that this prophet was going to come, that was going to be like unto Moses, and then he's going to rip into them and say, you're, you're the ones that rejected the just one. But... Again, I have to go through, you know, highlights because it just would take too long to go through all the things that he's saying in this sermon. But go to verse 42, so Acts chapter 7, verse 42. I do want to hit on this, dealing with uh, what he says to him. Remember, like I said, he's kind of, now he's coming, coming at him. He doesn't start straight at him. He doesn't just start, like, pointing to them and saying, you're doing this. Because it's kind of like he tells a story, then he's starting to get into some hard preaching with, with the Bible. But he's preaching to, you know, just basically quoting stuff that's in the Bible about Israel and how God was rebuking Israel and coming down on Israel. But then he's going to be like, you. You know, you did it just like them. And so uh, this is a nice three-point sermon, right? You know, where you're basically giving a nice little fluffy you know, reprove, rebuke, exhort. So he starts out with the exhort, then he's reproving, and then he's rebuking, right? So, uh, but anyway, in Acts chapter 7 and verse 42, it says, Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Molech and the star of your god Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Now, the first thing that he says there, it says, then God turned and gave them up to the host, to the to worship the host of heaven. He's talking about those that were in the wilderness, right? They saw the signs and wonders. They went through the Red Sea and all these things that he did for them. And then they wouldn't go into the promised land. Well, if you go to Psalm 81, because Psalm 81 talks about that too, about how he brought them out of the land of Egypt. And then he gave them up. Does that sound familiar? He gave them up. So he gave them up. It talks about to worship the host of heaven. He's talking about Israel, by the way. And Psalm 81 and verse 10. Psalm 81 and verse 10, it says, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. So I gave them up unto their own heart's lust. And they walked in their own counsels. Sound familiar? Go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 obviously is, is something that applies, it's been applying since the foundation of the world. Does that make sense? Meaning that being a reprobate, being a child of the devil, with Cain, right? We, we see the first case with Cain. Cain was of the wicked one, and he slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. So we know that that, was from the very beginning, and throughout time, this has always been the case where God is giving people over to a reprobate mind. But in particular, I believe this one reference here in Romans chapter 1 is referring back to the children of Israel in the wilderness. It says in, in Romans 1, verse 24, it says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts. Sound familiar? This is exactly what it says. 
in Psalm, 180, or Psalm 81, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Well, how did they do that? All I can think of, a calf that they made, right? Make us gods. You know, Aaron, he tells Aaron, make us gods, right? And isn't that what Stephen brings up to about the fact that they tell Aaron to make us gods for this Moses, we what not what has become of him, right? So <clears throat> we see that that's definitely true. But then it says that it says, as it is written in the book of the prophets. And then he quotes off actually something that's written in Amos. So go to Amos chapter 5, verse 25. You say, well, is this something that gives us more information? Yeah, but really I just wanted to hit on this point. <laughs> okay? Meaning that uh, this star of Rempan is really, you know, their, their star of David flag that they have. This is, that's their, the star of their god Rempan. Okay? And so that's the only place I see anything, you know, where we're talking about, besides if you want to talk about Balaam, where it says there's going to become a star out of Jacob, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, well, obviously they don't believe in Christ, so that doesn't apply to them. But then you have the star of Ramphan, their God. So uh, until they find out a better reason why they have that star, which they can't even tell you, I'm going with Amos, okay? I'm going with what, uh, what Stephen says here, okay? And so in uh, Amos chapter 5, verse 25, it says, Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? But ye have borne the tabernacle of your, of your Moloch and, Ch- and Chion, your images, the star of your God, which ye made to yourselves. Therefore will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, said the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. So in Amos, it actually doesn't tell you that it's Babylon, but it basically says it's beyond Damascus. Which makes sense because Damascus is Syria's capital and Babylon is further out, okay? And so that's obviously the Chaldean. So in the New Testament, he's he's clarifying. So you see how Stephen not only knows the scriptures, but he understands it. He understands that that passage right there is talking about them going into captivity of Babylon, okay? So, you know, you may not have known that. you, You probably read through this and be like, yeah, he definitely knows the scriptures. But he not only knows it, he knows the sense of it, and he knows exactly what it's talking about. And so, um, it makes you, res- I, you know, I'm sure you respected Stephen, right? <laughs> I don't think anybody's going through this and be like, I don't respect Stephen for what he did there. But it should really show you that this man really knew the Bible. And you may think, well, back then, they didn't really know that much and all that stuff. Yeah, right. I think Stephen knew more not. I, I would say Stephen probably knows more than I do or any other pastor I know. Okay? And I don't know that for sure, but good night. He has some knowledge here because I learned some stuff just reading this chapter. You know, and, you know, studying out this, right? I've learned some things that I didn't see before. Okay? And so, uh, but going on from there, uh, in verse 44... And this is one of the longest chapters in, in the book of Acts. So obviously, uh, I'm usually going verse by verse. But the reason I'm not going verse by verse through this is because most of this is just straight up quotations of the Old Testament. And so, um, you know, it's not like I, I'm going to explain, you know, what he's trying to say. He's just literally kind of reading the Old Testament and quoting it off and telling you the story, right? So, in Acts. 7 verse 44 it says this it says our fathers had a tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into into the possession of the Gentiles whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the d- days of David again you know just on the surface his knowledge in the chronological order of everything that's going on. He's like, there was a tabernacle in the wilderness unto David, and that's when David wanted to build the house of God, right? He wanted to build the temple, but it says, but then Solomon built it. And it's just line upon line, just showing you exactly what happened down the line. This is a great chapter to have memorized to just give you, like, the le- pretty much just the whole thing from Abraham down to Solomon, as far as what happened. And so, uh, but I want you to see here that it says... In verse 45 there, which also our fathers that came in after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles. This Jesus is talking about Joshua, the son of Nun. Okay? 
There's two places in the New Testament where Joshua is mentioned, and this is one of them. The other place is in Hebrews, okay? And, uh, and you say, well, it's Jesus. Well, Jesus is the name of Joshua in the New Testament, okay? And I proved this another time when we were talking about the name of Jesus. I believe, I think it was in Matthew chapter 1, but I was showing you that Joshua it was Jehoshua, and in another place it's called Jeshua, Okay, Jeshua, the son of Nun. And that, that's in Nehemiah and all that stuff, talking, calling back to Joshua, and it calls him Jeshua. Well, if you just drop the H, you pretty much have Jesus in there. Okay, And in, in Greek, a lot of times you see Elias, Elysius, Isaias. What is, what it, when you're translating, literating it from Greek, what do you usually add at the end? An S. Okay, So you can see jo- Jeshua or Joshua in this. So anyway, I don't want to re-preach that. I want to kind of prove it to you, though, with Hebrews chapter uh, 4. So go to Hebrews chapter 4, because it's another place where it's mentioned. And again, it, would you say that, that Jesus was there when they came into the promised land? Of course, okay? You could say, well, he's the angel that brought them in, okay? So I agree with that, okay? But... I believe, particularly, it'd be kind of weird if he's, like, talking about all these Bible characters and all of a sudden he's talking about an Old Testament appearance of Christ, like, leading them into the possession, okay? I personally believe this is talking about Joshua, the man Joshua, the physical man that led them into the promised land, okay? And so, uh, but in Hebrews chapter 4, what it, what it says here in verse 8, it says, For if Jesus had given them rest, then would, no, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Now, to get context here, he's talking about the Sabbath, and he's talking about the rest of them going into the Promised Land. If you don't believe me, go back to ver- uh, chapter 3 there. Chapter 3, in verse 18, it says, And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. That whole chapter there, it's talking about how he... Uh, for 40 years, suffered their manners in the wilderness, and talks about, you know, harden not your hearts, and it talks about how they provoked him, and it says all these carcasses fell in the wilderness, and they would not enter in because of unbelief. It's talking about going into the, so that rest is talking about going into the promised land, into the possession, right? So when you go into chapter 4, he's talking about the fact that, well, on the seventh day when God rested, you know, it says that, you know, God rested from all his work. So the Sabbath has to do with doing no works, right? But then it says that, but then it, it talks about this rest where they're going into the promised land, but what he's making a point is saying that there's another rest coming. And that's talking about heaven, okay? So there's, all, there's like three different rests that are mentioned. But in Hebrews chapter 4, when it says, for if Jesus had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. And it's talking about David would not speak of another day coming if that rest was like this eternal rest. Does that make sense? And so, you know, these two places is where you're talking about Joshua. Joshua, the son of Nun. Now, go to Colossians chapter 4, because I'm going to show you another place where it says Jesus, but it's not talking about Jesus, our Lord, okay? Because people are named Jesus, okay? Now, I personally would not name my child Jesus, okay? I know there's a lot, especially in the in, you know, Mexico and stuff like that, where they name their child Jesus, and st- or, you know, like Jesus. It's spelled that way, okay? So, um, it's not as, it doesn't sound as bad in English, right? Because Jesus is different than Jesus, but that's how you say Jesus Cristo, or Christos, you know, in Spanish. So, it would be weird if you spoke Spanish that you're calling someone Jesus, in my opinion, okay? I don't think, you know, but we call people Joshua, we don't take it that second thought, right? It's just the fact that uh, some names ha- are the same name. They're just different derivatives of it. Did you know that Jacob and James are the same name? I didn't know that for the longest time. It's funny because my cousin's name is James Jacob. <laughs> and so it's literally the same name over. Just It's just a different form of it. So Jesus, Joshua are the same name. Just as much as Jeshua, Jehoshua, and Joshua are all the same name. It's just different forms of it, okay? And so, but in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 11, it says, And Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, 
which have been a comfort unto me. So notice that there's another man named Jesus. You say, well, wasn't Jesus, you know, our, you know, it's just the name of our Savior? It says his name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins, because Jesus, Joshua means Savior. And I did a whole, like, kind of sermon on this. So it's just what the name means, okay? A lot of names mean stuff, okay? Um, and this isn't a sermon on, like, meanings of names. But throughout the Bible, when people would name people something, it would be like, well, we're going to call you Israel because you have power with God, or we call you Edom because you're faint, you know, and there's, there's a, a, a thing associated with it. So, but going on here in verse 51, I know I'm kind of just blowing through this, but really it's a long chapter, and I just want to hit the highlights here. So this is where he starts ripping their face off, okay? Like I said, he starts ripping into them, saying, hey, you know, Israel, God gave them up to worship those of heaven. And, you know, then, he, then it talks about how, you know, they're worshiping their god, Remphan, you know, the star of their god, Remphan, and Molech, and, and all this stuff, and how he's going to carry them away into Babylon. So he's getting into the judgment of Israel before he starts ripping their face off. Because notice what it says in verse 51. It says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. So notice how he, he, he didn't just say that, he showed where their fathers did that. Does that make sense? Like he, 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 so his sermon's perfect in the fact that he's, he's showing like, hey, here's the places where they did it. You did it too, and you're doing it now. And then he's, he you know, goes on in verse 52 there. It says, Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. So he, this is, this is, three verses here is really what he says directly to them. And then it goes on from there where they're going to end up killing him. But he just rips their face off. Now, there's a lot of things you can see in this statement that he says to him. He says, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. This flies in the face of Calvinism. Because they're, text verse, which, it, and this is where it comes into the fact that you can't do anything. You don't have free will, right? You can't resist. Uh, irresistible grace, right? Well, they'll go to Romans chapter 9 and verse 19 where it says, for who hath resisted his will? And it's a question that Paul's bringing forth this question. You may say, you know, who hath resisted his will? And, and you know what Paul's answer is that? He says no. He says nay. That's not a yes or no question, <laughs> okay? Basically what he's saying is that the, that's a horrible question. Like, that's a dumb question, right? And this proves to you that you can resist the Holy Ghost. And he's not only saying that the people that are there are resisting the Holy Ghost, he says, your fathers did too. Okay? So they were resisting the Holy Ghost before they were even there. But it throws, throws that out, right? But then he also says, he talks about who have received the law by the disposition of angels. Now, this is brought up actually a lot in the New Testament, talking about how, you know, they got the reward of God, right? And you can think about this. We went through the whole book of Daniel, and some of that is where angels were giving visions and telling Daniel what's going on. And so, but in Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2 talks about this too. In Hebrews chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1 is pretty much just stating that Jesus is better than angels, <laughs> okay? That's kind of the summary, right? Unto which the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Unto which the angels said, said he, you know, sit down on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Are they not all, all ministers, uh, ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Then it goes straight into chapter 2, and he's basically saying in chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense and reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Who are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus. Right? So in context, he's basically saying, well, back in the day, you know, angels would come and tell you the word of God, you know, and, and speak to the prophets and do all these different things. But now, how much more are you going to be judged because you've heard it from the Lord. And it says, first spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Right? 
And then it says, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, with di- and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. And I preached all about this when dealing with the apostles and how they were confirming the word with signs and wonders. And so what, what are we talking about? The word of God. And the word of God was given to Jesus, and we heard it straight from the mouth of the Lord. But notice that disposition of angels, right? It says that you received the law by the disposi- disposition of angels and have not kept it. Uh, going on there in verse 54, so they didn't like that. <laughs> they didn't like being rebuked. And in verse 54, it says, when, ye heard, when, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. So they just got schooled. Okay, so he's basically showing them, hey, I know the Bible. By the way, look at all these, you know, just some examples of Israel disobeying God and God punishing them. And by the way, you're just like them. You're just like them because you're resisting the Holy Ghost just like they did and, you know, just throwing down on them. And they did not like that. And it says they gnashed on him with their teeth. Go to Psalm 35. Psalm 35. Now, you may say, well, were they biting him? You know, I, I believe actually this is more of a figure of speech of where they were pretty much just like saying all kinds of things to him. They were probably cursing, cussing him out, like just you know, saying all kinds of crazy stuff to him. Maybe they did bite him, but I don't know. I think that's a little, that'd be a little strange, you know, they're literally chomping on his arm or something like that. But I believe this is an expression of like where they're basically gnashing on him with their teeth, meaning by what they're saying. You know, you ever hear the phrase like spitting venom? You know, like, you know, people are like, the just phrases you use. And what does that mean? You're not actually spitting out venom, are you? But what you're saying is really harsh stuff, right? You're saying some really hurtful things. And so gnashing on the teeth, I believe, is talking about that. But we do see this brought up in Psalms. Uh, in Psalm 35, verse 15, it says, But, but in mine, uh, but in mine, no, I'm sorry, but in mine adversity they rejoiced and gathered themselves together. Yea, the abjects gathered themselves together against me, and I knew it not. They did tear me and cease not. With hypocritical mockers and feasts, they gnashed upon me with their teeth. And isn't that the truth that you're dealing with here is a bunch of hypocrites that are saying that he's blaspheming Moses and the law and the temple and all that stuff when he just threw down as far as what the Bible teaches on this. And they're gnashing on him with their teeth. So basically, uh, I believe that personally, I believe that's talking about like things they're saying to him. Okay, just some nasty things that they're saying to him as they're leading him out to, to kill him. And so in verse 55, verse 55 of Acts chapter 7, I just want to read down to the end of the chapter here. It says, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So this is an amazing story because just the Bible knowledge. And later on in the next chapter, it's going to talk about how they mourned for Stephen. So he's a great man of God. They lost a soldier of Christ here. But obviously there, there's, there, there's a lot of good that came out of this, meaning that it, it spread everybody out. So this is actually a very good thing in the sense of like the cause of Christ that this happened. But uh, I want you to see that Jesus is standing at the right hand of God. That's something you don't see anywhere else, right? You see Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. Like constantly, he keeps bringing that up. He's sat at the right hand of the Father. He's sitting at, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He keeps bringing that up. But here he's standing, and it says it twice. It says that he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and then it says that he saw the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And obviously it's the same person, but, um, but it's just very clear that he's standing. He's not seated. And this makes me think of the fact that in Psalm 116, it says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And meaning that Jesus is normally seated, but when someone dies for him, he, will, he stands up. So that's a big deal. I mean, I, I think about that and just the fact that 
how much he cares and like he's taking notice of it. Like he's not like this is passing by him like oh it's just another day in the neighborhood. No, our Savior stood up while he was being stoned. And so that's a big deal. Also we see that witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Now we're going to see later on, obviously, that this is Paul. And, and you, you may think, you know, later on when he says, lay not the sin to their charge, you say, well, you know, these people are all a bunch of reprobates. Saul wasn't. And so, yeah, I mean, some of them weren't, but, you know, I, I'm personally glad. I'm sure Paul's personally glad that he prayed that prayer before he died that says, don't lay this sin on their charge because... Paul's one of those men that was standing there, right? And, but it also says in verse 59, it says, And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus. This is a great verse to show you that Jesus is God. He's calling upon God, and who's he talking to? Jesus, right? So that's a great verse for uh, dealing with uh, the deity of Christ. But... This is so reminiscent of the Lord Jesus Christ because one of the last things that Jesus says or one of the things that he says while he's on the cross is in Luke 23 and verse 34. It says, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And this is a little different what he says, but he basically says, Lay not the sin to their charge. But it's kind of similar in the fact of the mercy that he has and the love that he has for these for the people that are even stoning him. Because I don't believe all of them were reprobate. I believe that there definitely were some that that were there that were reprobate, but not everybody. And just because someone puts someone to death or does something horrible like that doesn't mean that they're without hope. They could maybe still have hope. Okay, and we know that there's definitely people that it's very obvious they're reprobate. You know, and it's not a but. What I'm saying with this is that you need to get people the benefit of the doubt. And if you're persecuted, if we go out soul winning and someone's like slamming a door in your face or they cuss you out, or even if they say something cross about our Savior, listen, unless it's obvious that this is like some queer, some like God-hating atheist like that's just like, like really hates God. I mean, it's just so obvious. But if someone, you know, is cross with you or whatever, you need to pray for them. You need to say, Lord, I hope they get saved. And even when we're dealing with persecution, you have people that are trying to get you to lose your jobs. You know, they're trying to destroy your life. You know what I pray? I pray they get saved because I don't want to see them in hell forever. Okay? And that's what, you know, Stephen's last words that he says. His last words are, lay not the sin to their charge. And so that's an amazing story dealing with Stephen. Not only was he a great man of God that knew the Bible, but he had... He had a lot of love for people. To say to the people that are that are to say about the people that are stoning him to not lay that sin to their charge. He's not saying, Lord, require this at their hand. You know what I mean? Like he's literally saying the opposite of that. That's amazing. So it really shows you a lot about Stephen. And so let's end with a word of prayer to Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening and just pray that you'd be with us as we go throughout the rest of this week. And Lord, just pray that you'd help us with our jobs, help us to get everything we need to get done. And Lord, I pray that you'd be with those that aren't feeling well, and just pray that you would heal and give health. I, I pray for the McCloy family, and just thank you for a healthy baby girl that was born, but also just pray that you'd be with, uh, with Crystal and the baby and just through the recovery. And Lord, just pray that you'd again be with us throughout this week. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.